This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. I have the chance to listen to this uh, back in, well, when we were both in Rome, and uh, it was fun. So I'm very happy that you have the same, uh, the chance to listen to this too. So, um, Seth Bernard is an associate professor of classics at the University of Toronto, where he has been teaching since 2014. His research focused broadly on the social and economic history of Roman Italy, in particular, of course, on, on the, of the Republican period. He's also deeply engaged in archaeology, and his research is committed to the use of new approaches drawn from science, archaeology, and social sciences to expand our historical understanding of the ancient Mediterranean world. His first monograph, Building Mid-Republican Rome, Labor, Architecture, and the Urban Economy, was published by uh, Oxford University Press in 2018. And um, his second monograph, entitled Historical Culture in Iron Age Italy, History, Archaeology, and the Use of the Past, uh, is due to appear in August, right? I'm, I'm very much looking for your cast. It's due to appear this, um, uh, this August, uh, always with Oxford University Press. And in addition, he has co-edited with Lisa Mignone and Daniel Paliglia Peralta, um, a volume and making the uh, making the mid republic new approaches to roman italy <clears throat> a volume intending to reframe the study of the middle republican period so and i think uh, Seth will forgive me if i do not delve uh, into his several additional book projects uh, he has published uh, 60 papers uh, and book reviews uh, on related themes in several prestigious journals once again i will not <laughs> um, yes, list them because it's too long. And uh, Seth has participated in archaeological fieldwork projects for over a decade and is now the co director of the archaeological excavation in Faleri Novi, uh, together with colleagues from Harvard and the British School at Rome. And there you go. <laughs> thank so. you, Lucia. Let, let, thank you so much. Let me share my screen and then give mm -hmm. you a proper. Thank you, and everyone can let me know if uh, if it it looks okay. People can see it fine. Perfect. Great. Okay. So uh, thank you so much, Lucia. It's a real honor and a pleasure to be here. I think, as uh, Lucia made clear, uh, I am an archaeologist and historian, um, but I focus on a period uh, of of Rome's rise to power in which coins are first made, and so I am sort of per perforce a numismatist. Uh, I'm also the son and grandson of very big uh, coin people, U.S. coin people. So I'm um, a very big collectors. So I'm delighted to be giving a talk to the INS. Now, I should also say that in about 2007, um, a lot of this project started uh, as a dissertation at the University of Pennsylvania um, uh, and a conversation in New York with Rick Wichunk, with the, the late Rick Wichunk. So, uh, you know, again, uh, I feel as though I have these old connections to numismatists, and even if I feel as uh, a bit of an interloper here. I'm really delighted uh, to have a chance to speak to this crowd. And I thank you all at the ANS again. Uh, what I wanna do today, I'll minimize my screen, there we go. What I wanna do today um, is in many ways uh, a literature review, but it, it's a literature review, uh, I think uh, of a pretty fundamental problem, not only in Roman numismatics, but in Roman history and a problem uh, that, um, uh, that has been central to my own work uh, for a little while. And it's this, uh, Rome is you know, in, in global history, Rome is one of the most famous monetized states. And we think of the denarius, we think of recent work uh, on um, metal production, lead production coming out of Spain and in, in Greenland. And we, we think of Rome as synonymous with uh, the production of coinage and the Roman economy as very much a, a monetized economy. Uh, and yet Rome has a really weird early history of coinage. And it's weird for these reasons. Um, we know that the Roman economy was monetized uh, for a very long time. And this is not the point of my talk today, but from the early Iron Age, and here I'm talking about the ninth, eighth century, uh, we know that it's transacting with uh, standard measures and those measures are often in metal. And I show a piece of famous ice rude uh, from the ANS collection up on the right here. 
Um, and just to give a, a really interesting example, this, this is a little amphora from the Palatine, uh, and it is 0.272 uh, meters tall exactly. And Gabriele Cifani has recently pointed out that that measurement uh, is precisely the same measurement as the Roman foot uh, found in Rome's earliest temples. And here we are in the late seventh, early sixth century, and we're seeing measurements cross media, cross materials, um, cross different transactions. So Rome has this very compl complex um, uh, use of measurements, use of metal uh, for economic purposes of various sorts, starting from a very early period. We also know now that Rome was very much in contact with Greek societies that are using coins from, that, from around that same period. Uh, Rome has very little Greek coinage itself, uh, but we know through stylistic connections, through trading connections, that they're very in very close contact with the Eastern Mediterranean where coinage is arising. Uh, and yet Rome does not start to use coins until around 300 BCE. Uh, so for two, 300 years uh, after coinage is becoming fairly prominent in these societies they're in contact with, Rome is, is still using that early Iron Age system as far as we can tell. And as I wanna talk about today, for the first 100 years of Rome's coin use, uh, it looks very strange. It does not look like the denarius system uh, that we're all used to. So solving these problems, understanding what's happening with the first hundred years uh, of Roman coinage is sort of a fundamental question, not only of numismatics, but of Roman economic history uh, writ large. Now, it's also a very long standing uh, question and, and problem. I show you Joseph Eckel, uh, who was working on these issues in the Enlightenment on the left. Theodore Momsen wrote a book on these issues. Uh, we know the work of Rudy Thompson, of Michael Crawford, Andrew Burnett coming in the latter half of the 20th century. Uh, there's a Istituto Italiano uh, conference proceeding in 1999. So there's a real dense amount of scholarship uh, on this subject. And the question uh, that I think all of you are asking is what's changed? What prompts a talk again, a return to some of these topics? Um, so uh, in as uh, Lucio, and there she is there, and here's her lovely write up and pocket change uh, of the conference. As she was mentioning, in February of this year, uh, Fleur Kemmers and Marlene Termir got a group of about 20 scholars together in Rome. Uh, and we all agreed that there was so much new uh, and dynamic material for this subject uh, that a new statement um, was needed. And we're currently working on a, a collaborative paper, a collaborative publication in this regard. And that's sort of what I want to bring uh, to you today. So, so what is new? Well, first of all, there have been new discoveries. I'll talk both about single coins, uh, also about uh, hoards um, and some other publications. There's been renewed debate. Some of that thanks to some, I think, very wrong positions that have been put forward by scholars, but they've helped us uh, encourage us to relitigate some of the issues very productively. Um, there's been a lot of work on Italian coinage and monetary systems as of late. I'm not going to talk too much about this, um, uh, but there's been a, a lot of advances uh, on these sort of other uh, coinage systems in which Rome's early coinage was circulating. Uh, and finally, there's been substantial work on the issues themselves. There's been a lot of closer look uh, at this third century coinage uh, than done 20, 30 years ago. And I really wanna stress here that what I'm talking about today uh, is very much sort of the, uh, the collaborative effort, a number of scholars um, who deserve credit by name, Lee Viero, Andrew Burnett, Christina Molinari, Marta Barbato, uh, Andrew Mar uh, McCabe, Pierluigi De Bernardi. I I'm convinced I'm leaving out names here, um, but I've tried as far as possible to give credit where credit is due. Uh, I wanna present sort of a, a new field and not simply my own uh, accomplishments here. The last shift that's hugely important is a historical shift. Uh, in recent years, our knowledge of mid-Republican Rome, that is the period from about 400 to 200 BC, the period from uh, Rome, the, the initial formation of the patricio plebeian state uh, to the conflicts against Carthage uh, has come under uh, some very serious attention. And uh, as Lucia alluded to, I've recently put out an edited volume on this fact. Uh, coinage is now much more a part of this discussion than it was before. So our historical understanding of this period is moving along. Uh, we're appreciating it much better. And one reason we're doing that is because we are integrating, I think, coins into this historical picture as we never have uh, before. So that's where I'm coming from and that's what I wanna discuss. So what are we talking about? So this is what uh, Rudy Thompson, Michael Crawford and Andrew Burnett accomplished uh, already. Uh, Roman coinage around 300 BC and the, uh, I'm gonna get into the absolute dates in a bit, but the relative dates are fairly well established. Uh, arrives to us in a number of branches. And most of you will be familiar with this. 
Uh, very early on, we have these coins that share iconography with, with Naples and seem to be struck there, these bronzes. Uh, they're known only from a small handful of examples. They may belong uh, to the period right after the uh, Rome's um, alliance with Naples uh, in 326 BCE. Uh, about a generation later, we have a number of branches that emerge. We have these money bars that's not shown to scale, but uh, would be much larger. Um, their use is still a little obscure. Lee uh, Yarrow is doing some fantastic metallurgical work on these. Um, their iconography often shows signs of the Pyrrhic War, so they're often related to around that period. Um, what they're used for, again, it's very unclear. They don't seem to be bullion because of their metallurgical context uh, content. Um, they, uh, one of them has a, a, a dedication, a religious dedication in Austin uh, on it. Um, I'll talk about some examples that come from a civic building. So again, not really clear what these are there for. We then have a uh, cast bronze in coin form, the so-called heavy bronze or ice graue. And I'll be referring to all these from their Roman Republican coinage uh, um, numbers, but these are these massive coins. Um, uh, the liberal bronze around 300, maybe 280 BC, we'll get into it. Uh, a supra liberal or a more than one pound bronze uh, series, uh, 18 one, I'll challenge that in a second. And then a slow reduction of those coins over the third century. Uh, and then we have a seriation of the so-called Romano Campanian coinage. These are struck coins. Uh, they're on a Greek model here. Um, there's seven digrams there. Uh, and the big shift that I'll be talking about is between Romano and Roma on their legend there. Uh, and I've grouped them as such. Uh, they are seriated, again, going back to Thompson, by their reducing weight, by changes in their fabric. So those early ones, the 13 one there, which is very isolated, um, usually on these very tall flans, they're sort of very, very puffy coins. Uh, and then they, um, they're they sort of productively uh, a little flatter, a little more centered uh, as we move forward in time. Uh, and we'll talk about those. Uh, again, they slightly reduce in weight over time. Uh, and then, and there are some associated struck bronze coins that I'll talk about uh, in a moment. And then by the uh, end of this series, we get these very sort of spread plans uh, with the quadrigatus. Uh, I'm showing you one from the very early series, which has the Incus Roma on the reverse. Uh, these are um, a much larger um, strike than anything that comes before. Uh, and then also an associated bronze, the so-called prow, uh, prow bronzes, uh, which again are much larger than anything that comes forward. And all sorts of dates have been put forward to these, uh, 269, 225, 240. I'll argue for something like 219, 218 uh, in today's talk. But that's the series that we're talking about. So my main thesis for today, the, the series, the, the, the relative chronology is fairly well established. Um, it's the absolute chronology that I think we've made some uh, important advances on. The other thing uh, that we've made important advances on is the structure and convergence of these coinages. So I talked about how these emerge for us as different branches of coins, um, but over time they come together. And I think that moment at which they merge, at which the struck and the cast coins merge, and I won't have much to say about the um, money bars, but at which the struck and the cast coins merge um, is a really fundamental moment for Rome's conception of coinage, for its understanding uh, of what coins are and how they work. And then finally, time permitting, I got about three slides to cover all of Middle Republican history. Um, but at the end of my talk, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the historical interpretation of this material. So once we've gained a better picture of the chronological movement uh, of what's going on in terms of the interrelationship of the metals and the techniques of the production of these coinages, uh, what can that tell us um, about Roman society? And, and how can this coinage serve as an index of all the myriad changes going on historically uh, at this moment. All right, so with that, I'm just gonna jump in. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move fairly chronologically and I'm just gonna go through um, a number of sort of finds or advances and discuss them uh, as we move forward. Um, the first is just to say that, you know, increasingly, you know, one after another, we're getting reports of these coins, Romano Campanian or uh, Ice Graue uh, from a number of, of different sites and these are coming in uh, to us. Still, I think nothing has been as important as the publication in the 1990s uh, of an instance of RRC 13.1, that is the very earliest Roman diagram, the Mars horsehead diagram, uh, in layers from uh, Posidonia Pestum, uh, which I show in two slides here. You may know this site. We're down in Campania along the coast. 
uh, and you see the colonial wall. The colony of, of um, Pestum is created at the Greek site of Posidonia in 273 BC, 273, 272 BC. Uh, and at that moment, a wall is built. And in layers of the colony cut into by the wall, we find an example of this coin. So we get this very good terminus antiquem uh, for this coin of 272 BC. It's one of the very first fixed points, archaeological fixed points uh, for this coin. It adheres with most ideas of the date of this coin, which usually go from about 320 to 300. One scholar has put it as late as 275, which now seems less likely. But anyway, it does push that coin, you know, certainly earlier uh, than Pliny had suggested. I have almost nothing to say about Pliny today, um, but that's been an important find. Uh, other sort of advances as far as it goes, uh, recent publication of material from Trebla uh, Mutuesca, uh, here in the Sabines, um, uh, so moving into central Italy, uh, we're finding both struck and cast coinage together, something that was fairly rare and that we'll see again uh, within fairly similar uh, archaeological context. So the idea of circulation is being pushed forward a little bit uh, by archaeological finds. And uh, something that I find very interesting because I work at this site is that there's been an example um, of uh, RSC 26.4 um, of one of the later, the Roma, um, series uh, of um, silver and bronzes from Falari Vetres, the city destroyed by Rome in 241 BC uh, that's just been published by uh, Fiorenzo Catali. Um, I think that that coin probably tells us more about Falari Vetres and continuity of occupation at that site uh, than it does about the date of the coin itself. But it's right around the period where we think we place that coin for other reasons uh, and other hordes that I'll come to uh, in a moment. Okay, so in terms of hordes and for our knowledge of the early coins, what do we know? Well, this hoard was first published uh, in, um, in the 1990s by uh, Valeria Celia there and discussed in a really fundamental article by Andrew Burnett in 2006. Um, it is, I think, one of the uh, most important finds for our, our um, relative chronology uh, of the early Roman um, silvers. And the reason is that it is the very first hoard to contain the first and the second, I showed there, RC 13 and 15 uh, didrams uh, together in one hoard. Um, it's 163 coins in a black gloss ope. It has only three examples of RC 13. They're very worn. It has five fresh dilinked examples of RC 15. And then it has a lot of this sort of nucleus of mid uh, third century uh, Italian coinage. That mid third century nucleus would tend to draw the date of this hoard down to the middle of the third century uh, and would tend to downdate RRC 15.1 about 20 years further uh, than it was initially placed, so around 260. The other major thing here is that RRC 13, the Mars horsehead diagram, uh, was this, again, it, it's found in numerous hoards from South Italy, but it's never found with other Roman coins. Always one or two examples uh, with, um, with coins of Naples and Taros and various things like that. Uh, and for that reason, it was always seen as fairly isolated and placed very early, maybe 320, uh, 315, something like that, um, because it was not in contact with these other coins. Here, finally, it is, and this tends to draw down the date um, of RRC 13.1. Along with that Pestum uh, find, it would tend to move down the date, I think, to around uh, closer around 300 or a few years uh, after that. Now, this is an interesting hoard. It was excavated. Um, from what is probably um, a villa site, so uh, not an urban site, which itself uh, is interesting. Um, and it has a quite a large spread, chronological spread of coins. And so um, I was speaking uh, in Rome with Marta Barbato about this word, and she suggested to me that it's very possible um, because of the wear differential and because of the widespread of coins that we, we're talking here of a hoard that had been deposited into twice. And so even though it shows those first two gyrams together, that it may be a case of a very long accretion of coinage, that it doesn't necessarily need to put those diagrams within the same moment of circulation, uh, even as it's somewhat closing the gap uh, here. But I think what it's doing here is it's putting RRC 15 closer to the closure uh, of this hoard around 260, 250, and RRC 13 um, earlier, if not immediately earlier, still in the, you know, around 300 BC. So a fundamental hoard um, for that reason. Uh, another recent hoard that uh, Barbato herself recent, uh, has just published in 2019, uh, it was in fact found in the 1980s, 
Um, again, a site that looks, it's not an urban site. Um, the site itself is not well known. It may be a small uh, hilltop site uh, or a rural site um, across the Apennines in the Potenza Valley. Uh, again, showing how um, Rome's early coinage is moving eastward and moving southward. And especially its struck coinage is very much a part of monetization circles uh, in Southern Italy, no surprise there. What this hoard does is it reinforce, you know, though we are from San Martino and Pencilis, though we're drawing down RFC 13.1 a bit, we're still seeing it as part of the same picture. And what that picture is, um, is uh, a very few number of these early um, specimens of RRC 13.1, these first diagrams circulating within this larger nucleus uh, of Italian coinage from Southern Italy, from uh, Naples, um, from Metaponto, from Turi, um, from Heraclea, from Velia. These are the main coins in this period. So Rome is not immediately moving in and taking over the monetary system of Southern Italy, but they are sort of a small beans um, participant in this monetary system uh, at that moment here. Um, and I think this is uh, good to reinforce. Those four specimens of RC 13.1 in this Ope, in this Ornacque here, are one of the most of any uh, 13.1 to appear in one of these very typical Italian hordes. Uh, and even so, we're talking about four of 146 silver coins. So this very sort of tentative um, participation in circulation rather than any sort of um, grander movement into coinage here uh, is what's given um, by, this, um, by this find. Okay, so moving from the diagrams now to the struck bronze, uh, we have some pretty interesting stuff coming from the coast uh, of Latium. And here uh, I have the work of uh, Molinari to thank, and also this really interesting recent article by Termir uh, and Neyman here uh, in AIN 2020. Um, from Pratica de Mare, so this is ancient Lavinium. Uh, this is about, well, about 45 minutes drive down. Of, it's on the coast, uh, well associated with Aeneas here. Um, of the coast of Lazio, uh, a small, it's probably scattered hoard was found in a civic destruction that's destroyed by fire around 250 BC. And the date is fairly well established archeologically. It's first published in sort of summary fashion and then reanalyzed recently by, um, uh, by Cristina Molinari. There are 44 pieces here. It's all bronze in this period, of course, as in many other periods, hoards tend to be uh, single metals here. But what's super interesting is that this hoard includes Roman, uh, Roman money bars and ice rude alongside struck bronzes of Naples, Suessa, and other Italian sites. So for one of the first uh, times, we're seeing a mixture, because we don't tend to see this, a mixture of uh, cast, in this case, the money bars and struck uh, coins around the middle uh, of the third century BC. What's interesting here is though we do have, what, what else is interesting is though we do have this Roman money bar, these two fragments of a money bar here, what we don't have are any Roman struck bronzes. And you know, this is an argument from silence this is what we do with these hordes, of course, but it's a pretty powerful one because these bronzes, this is a very large uh, production. We have a number of the bronzes that it's circulating with uh, in this horde, we're very close to Rome. This is a city with very close contacts with Rome. We have Roman money bars here, um, but it leads us to think that this horde was probably made after, uh, or excuse me, before the, the uh, striking of this um, RRC 17, uh, of this probably Litra or Roman struck bronze. Um, what this does is it tends to downdate that Roman struck bronze quite a bit, that Romano bronze. I'll show you a picture right there. This Romano bronze uh, was initially associated, the iconography is identical to that of a bronze made at the Roman colony of Coza in 273 BC. And it was often associated with the creation of Coza. So Romans made Coza, they struck these bronzes under the name of Coza, the Latin colony, and they also struck their own bronzes um, themselves with, the, with Romano uh, on the back. This would move that bronze down maybe 20 years. Um, and indeed, new study of the circulation of this bronze in Etruria uh, finds it uh, much more diffuse. So again, when Crawford was working, when uh, Thompson was working, we knew of these bronzes largely from the coast of northern Etruria. Uh, we now find them at Lucas Feronii at various sites further south. Uh, and this coin seems much more diffuse and much later, uh, no longer associated with the creation of the colony of Coza. Uh, and, you know, uh, for our for our seriation and our relative chronology, what it's doing is it's pushing those Romano coinages 
which used to be lumped in the early part of the third century, now into the middle part of the third century, uh, further downward in time. And that will be important uh, to take forward from there. Um, another recent paper that does exactly the same thing um, by the two uh, great Andrews of Republican coinage, Andrew Burnett and uh, Andrew M McCabe, um, uh, tackles RRC 23, which is another one of these outlier isolated bronze strikes that's always been hard to fit into our larger schema. Um, this is a large bronze. The unit has always been weird. It's found mostly in Sicily or almost entirely in Sicily. So it tends to be, it's thought to be Sicilian uh, and it has Romano legend. So it belongs to the earlier period of struck uh, coinage in the third century. Uh, Burnett and McCabe observed that the eagle with its spread wings and its turned back head only really appears on these Ptolemaic bronzes. First, a very rare bronze of 260 to 240 BCE, and then prominently on this octobal issued around 240 BCE. And so by virtue of this, they date the Roman coin after its prototype to sometime around that same date. And what this means is again, Romano coin, coins, that early phase of striking here has to be extended forward in time to the period probably of the end of the first Punic War, which ends in 241 BCE, and then even after that. So the moment after the first Punic War. So that sort of um, sporadic use of Roma, the, those Roma coins all have to be placed from about 300 down to 240 uh, right now. And I'll get more into that uh, moving forward. All right, uh, this will be the last hoard that I'm gonna talk about here. Uh, there's some other really interesting, I, I should note there's a, you know, a newish hoard from Monte Bebele, the Gallic site in the Po Valley. Um, there's great new stuff coming out of Morgantina uh, and Alex Walthall's work, um, but those are a little later than what I'm talking about here. The last hoard I wanna talk about instead um, which again is pushing that Romano coinage forward in time, uh, comes from Sardinia, has been published by Giovanni Gorini. Uh, this is a hoard from Nora, which is a very well excavated site west of Cagliari in an area of initial intense Roman activity uh, on the island of Sardinia. And if you remember your history here, uh, Sardinia is uh, taken over by Rome in the aftermath of the First Punic War. So we are, um, we are again, after the First Punic War here, uh, when we find um, this uh, this hoard. Um, it is a, a, a smaller silver hoard. It has 18 silver diagrams. Guarini suggests because of its size that it may in fact be a votive deposit uh, and not necessarily a hoard. 11 of those diagrams are silver. Note how different that is from those early, from the early San Martino and Pencilis hoard, right, where we had just a little bit of Roman coinage. Now Roman coinage is really starting to take over um, these, these hoarding contexts here. Uh, and within that, we have two, uh, we, excuse me, we have five Romano silvers, which are more worn. And then we have six uh, of the Roma series silvers. And those Roma uh, series uh, issues, I'm sorry, there's a mistake on the slide there. It says Romano, but the last bullet point should say Roma. The six later Roma issues are fresh. They're dilinked. And this really suggests that this deposit dates to around the period of their production. And what that does is it draws down that moment to again, the early 230s, the same period that we saw that Sicilian with a Ptolemaic prototype with the Romano legend. Um, uh, and the same period, again, around a little later when we have RSC 17. So everything is moving forward in time in terms of the shift from Romano uh, to the Roma series. Uh, struck coinage here. The other thing that's very noticeable about this is the absence of the quadrigatus. There are massive hordes of quadrigati uh, from um, Sardinia. They are later hordes. And I think the Nora Herod in particular, um, because it shows sort of a snapshot of fresh circulation coming from Rome to the island during the early moments uh, of Roman occupation there, uh, is really showing us that there's no quadrigatus in circulation this early. Um, this to me really clinches the case. There have been recent arguments for an early quadrigatus, um, but I think this hoard in particular is showing that it must fall after this moment, after the 230s. And I'll talk a little more about that uh, in just a second. In fact, I'll talk about that in the next slide. Uh, so uh, when we talk about the quadrigatus here, uh, we have to give great credit to the work of Pierluigi De Bernardi, uh, who's done sort of uh, taken us, uh, taken enormous steps here in terms of advancing our knowledge uh, of, uh, of this coin series. Again, this is, this is a massive coin series. Um, I'll talk uh, about some denominational curiosities to it later. Uh, it's much larger than any other struck 
um, coins that come before. It's Rome's last Greek style diagram uh, before minting, well, you know, I suppose the Victoriatus uh, coming after is a dram perhaps, um, but uh, it, it is a sort of uh, volt face in terms of uh, Roman coin production here. Uh, among the many things De Bernardi has been able to establish here uh, is that it, it's a much more complex coinage than we ever thought. He's identified brand new instances here. So I show this, this is a 2018 um, uh, paper here. And if you look at the, uh, the issues on the right, you see this um, fractional unit, which has a prancing horse, uh, which he's brought, I think, three more examples uh, to light. And then in between that, on the right-hand side, the dram there, uh, he's been able to identify from um, probably of a Spanish origin from uh, the coin from uh, private sale, uh, these drams with an oath scene on the reverse, which matches the oath scene gold um, of the same period. So it's a very complex, enormous issue. Uh, it also has very strong relationships with Spain. So I show you here my attempt a few years ago to try and map where the hordes come from. Uh, and you see there are a number of hordes from the West, uh, hordes that really fit the theater of the Second Punic War here. Um, and not only that, but this uh, Alberede et al. paper I cite up at the top right there, I put on the uh, list up at the top right there, um, uh, uh, up at the top right there, um, uh, proves that some of the earliest incuse version uh, quadrigati are using Spanish metal which is something we can't really see Rome getting a hold of until after the First Punic War either. So there's a very close relationship with the geopolitical context uh, of, um, of uh, the Second Punic War. Uh, in 2013, Filippo Corelli, who is one of the sort of greatest living Roman archaeologists, put out a book on early Roman coinage. And he made the argument that the Quadrigati was produced essentially because it's such a massive coinage, was the Ardentum Signatum that Pliny identifies starting in 269 BC and was produced effectively sort of serially uh, for the next however many decade until the denarius. Um, I think that all of this work really convincingly disproves this idea. It's a much later coin, although Corelli's thesis has really opened up the debate uh, in very healthy ways. Um, this coin is very much a coin of the Second Punic War, either um, started a few years beforehand or is it's being made initially um, for the sort of run up or lead up to the Second Punic War. And this is something that's also really been supported by De Bernardi's work uh, on, um, on, uh, the, the, on dye links uh, for the coinage as well that I can talk about a little more uh, in questions time permitting. Okay, let's switch now to the cast coinage and some advances here. Uh, so uh, first thing here is we have a couple new hordes. Uh, and uh, of the liberal and um, and super liberal, uh, the liberal and super liberal um, uh, cast bronzes, uh, and uh, I refer to these here. They've been studied very well by again Christina Molinari in conjunction with uh, Alessandro Maria Yaya because they come from a site that Yaya has been excavating at uh, the port of Lavinium uh, on um, on the coast, uh, a, a cult site that's associated. Uh, again, with the worship of Aeneas. Um, one of those hordes in particular looks like a foundation hoard of a major phase of that site, uh, and it's in a black gloss cup, and that black gloss cup is now very well dated thanks to the work of Antonio Ferrandes, who's revolutionized our seriation of uh, Vernicinera from uh, Rome um, uh, uh, to 280 to 260 BC. So the date is fairly similar to where we put it, maybe a little later uh, than where Burnett has initially put it. Uh, but what's quite interesting is it would seem that the liberal uh, and super liberal bronzes are lasting for a very long time. Uh, in her publication, her discussion of the Carbignano hoard, a uh, hoard from private context um, that, uh, or a rescued context that Molinari uh, has recently put out, uh, again with Yaya, she notes that uh, the Labruna hoard uh, of liberal cast bronzes uh, is from a, uh, um, a sanctuary outside the Roman city of, a uh, Roman colony of Spoleto, founded in 241 BCE. Uh, so it would seem that these liberal coins are in use for a very long time. Uh, these very large, awkward, clunky uh, ice guaiwi. You could see where I'm going here, right? You have this early phase of Roman coinage, the, the, the Romano struck coins, the heavy uh, um, cast coins, and they're now, you know, we used to sort of cluster them early and say Rome sort of got over it very quickly and started doing a better coinage, but we're now moving these down well far into the second century and, and past the point 
uh, of the first uh, Punic War. Now, why were they made? Well, the initial date at 280 to 260 window um, seems to relate them in Molinari and Yaya's mind to a series of these fortified uh, castra or campsites up and down the Latin coast. There's one around the temple of Sol Indiges. Uh, there's another one around the temple of, um, uh, of Castrum Inui, just to the south by Ardea. Uh, Ostia is a very famous example of another one, uh, probably a little earlier. Minturni has another, but Rome is sort of stepping up its military defense, its naval defense uh, of, these, of these interfaces between rivers and the coast. In the early third century BC, this was expensive. Uh, and this may be uh, the reason why it starts um, producing and sending out uh, these coins, although their use uh, is a little strange. They're very closely associated with uh, also with sanctuary sites. Uh, and I'll come back to that uh, in a bit. Okay, the other big change here, and I have to give Liv, I think uh, Liviero is on this uh, uh, Zoom, so I have to give her great credit for this uh, in a really brilliant paper on uh, these early bronzes here, um, comes from uh, considering uh, their weights. And what she did is she took um, from Haberlin and from, uh, from CRRO, uh, she took data of the uh, weights of these early liberal and super, super liberal uh, bronzes. Uh, and she found that the actual statistical variation of these coins, so this is 14 and 18, uh, is much less significant uh, than Thompson and Crawford uh, initially thought. Now, I've highlighted the sentence in question here. The designation of RC 18 uh, as a supra-liberal standard, so weighing consistently more than, than a Roman pound, in contrast, the liberal standard of 14 should be abandoned. Uh, given that it was this supposed supra-liberal quality that led Thompson to seriate them uh, 18 and 19 after 14, uh, we can no longer support this chronological seriation uh, on these grounds. She suggests, and I think I agree, that they're all coming out around the same period. Again, right, the production of RSC 14 now looks like it lasts for 40 years. And for whatever reason, for reasons which are really obscure, Rome is putting out uh, several series of these uh, cast bronzes with different iconographies um, and with different weights uh, for uh, a series of several decades. Um, she's also pointed out in a, a recent long table talk um, that these coins are super weird from a, a standpoint of weight. Um, they are, in some sense, both fiduciary and non-fiduciary. They all seem to have their value, or most of them have their value indicated on them. Um, but Romans really didn't care about the lower denominations. The uncha, and there's a typo there, uh, the samuncha uh, are often the exact same weight, even though they have very different uh, standards of value on them. And it's very hard to explain just what it is they're doing uh, as money. I think, I think again, the, the strangeness of this material, its variance from what we would expect coins to do uh, is really noteworthy. And this is something Leaves paper uh, has gone a long way uh, towards, um, towards discussing. So let me, um, let me start to draw together this first part uh, of my paper and then I'll move towards the convergence of these systems. So RSC one and two, I didn't talk about these remain outliers. We haven't really found much more about these. Um, they're not really part of this struck Romano Campania system. They're very much part I think of the coinage of Naples. RC 13-1, the Mars Horsehead uh, Romano coin, uh, is our first diagram. It remains isolated, but it should be downdated slightly, maybe around 300 BC, maybe a little after, certainly not after the foundation of Posidonia Pestum, but, but closer to that date based on San Martino and Pencilis. Meanwhile, the second diagram also has to be moved down. So there's still a gap between 13 and 15. Um, it moves down to around 260, uh, where it's hoarded fairly fresh at San Martino. Uh, the RSC 17 one, that Romano bronze comes after that. And in general, the transition to the Roma series happens later than we ever thought. Uh, it seems to happen after the first Punic War. So these sort of, um, ro all of the Romano coinage and those heavy ice grawe are all in use during the first Punic War. Uh, 13, 15, 20, and 22, um, we now put, between 300 and 240 plus 16, 17, uh, also probably 23 uh, in that window. And it's only really after the first Punic War that Roma coins appear, 25, 26, uh, 27 in the related issues. I'll talk about those in a minute. And then once again, the quadrigati represent a major change in terms of their distribution. Uh, they come in much larger hordes, uh, everything like that. So Rome's minting goes from fairly slow, Romano, fairly fast, the Quadrigatus in particular, pretty quickly. It ramps up pretty quickly. 
Uh, and this speed up is not directly related to the cost of the first Punic War. Something else uh, is driving this. I'll argue for social factors at the end of my talk. The use of caste coinage, meanwhile, including ice rudin, ice ignatum, continues a very long time. Uh, the material from Pratica di Mare shows that even in the middle of the third century, Rome was still very comfortable using or, or uh, combining um, so-called pre-monetary instruments or pre-coinage money uh, with coin money in ways which are very striking to us. Meanwhile, uh, they're also not so attentive to weights. It now seems that the liberal and the supra or super liberal uh, coins are circulating together for a very long period of time, uh, and they're not really paying a lot of attention, uh, attention to um, making sure the weight is exact across these series, um, although uh, the marks of value on the coins show some attention within the sets uh, right there. Um, there is uh, the major change in weight reduction, but that really comes uh, with the shift uh, to the Roma coinage. So as, as I talked about, it, my, my paper in Rome was very concentrated on this moment because I think it's very much underappreciated. But what this means is that the shift from, and I've got this backwards on the slide, I apologize, the shift from Romano to Roma coinage around 240 BC is really fundamental. It's not just a shift in iconography, but it seems to be a whole cognitive shift in how Romans are understanding coins as money. What do I mean? Well, for the first time with RRC 25, one through nine, and the club series RRC 27, I'm showing one through three, five through 10 here, um, we have integrated struck and cast coinage. Um, we see with uh, above with RC25, the sickle series. You see it's at the left of the horse and then appearing on all the cast bronzes. And then the club doing the same thing uh, below um, to the left of uh, the beardless Mars right there. Uh, and then uh, moving through uh, the coinage right there. Um, we have this sort of integration of cast and struck. This is a remarkable thing. In terms of production here and technique, these are two wildly different techniques, right? And we've always thought that um, casting coins happened at Rome, that, that the, um, the struck coins are happening in Naples or Greek communities. But now, finally, the Roman mint, it would seem, is really able to control both techniques happening once. They're coordinating them together. Uh, they're interested in weights. They're interested in denominational integration. They're interested in coins as coins as they really never have uh, ever in the past. And I think, again, um, uh, this is a fundamentally undervalued moment for the sort of change or shift uh, in terms of Rome's use and understanding of coins as coins. What's really interesting about, I mean, there are many interesting things about this. Another interesting thing about this is that RRC 25, the sickle series, reproduces the bronze iconography of RRC 14, the liberal cast bronzes, although now integrated with the struck coins. And 27, the club series, does the same thing for 18, uh, the so-called supra-liberal uh, bronzes, but again, now integrating them uh, with reduced weight um, into the uh, struck coinage. Uh, so there is this acknowledgement, you know, Romans, to Romans, you know, Romans, you may have been using these things before, you may have even been using them as coins, you know, they're very strange objects. Now, finally, uh, you can rest assured that these things whose iconography you're familiar with are coins and we're going to integrate them in uh, to our wider uh, denominational structure. The question this raises is what the heck the earlier um, uh, cast bronze is. And I, I'm going to say this very quickly, and I'm happy to talk about it a little bit more. Uh, Lee, very interestingly, I, I like this in her long table talk, said, you know, the denominational structure of these is super weird. These things appear out of nowhere with this massive, you know, the, a semuncha of cast bronze has almost no value. And yet Romans are really attentive to making these. They remind me of, you know, as a kid, I used to get the sets from the US Mint with every single uh, unit there. There'd be sort of coin sets right here. And they pop up immediately with almost no value uh, in the early third century. What is going on there? Um, to me, uh, I suggested, you know, we, we have no um, she said they spring like Athena from the head of Zeus. They're sort of fully formed. And I think that's right. We have no um, um, we have no numismatic parallels for this, no good ones. And one parallel, one material parallel that I think we might want to consider are, are weights. Uh, we have a lot of Iron Age weights. I see, I show you Zamboni's picture here and, and the famous material from Marzabotto. Uh, these are sets of weights that are consistent within themselves, but not necessarily across sets, just the same way as the liberal and super liberal bronzes behave. And they tend to have marks of value going back to the early Iron Age. I'm happy to expand more about that. Uh, in questions, but I think we may need to think about these early uh, cast bronze, not so much as coins behaving 
uh, as coins, but as something a little different. Of course, the Quadrigatus sees the perfection of the process that we saw initiated uh, with RSC 25 and 27 with the sickle and the club series. Here we have the addition of gold. We have much more variety in the subunits of silver as De Bernardi has shown us. Um, and I'm showing you just an example of that. The other very interesting thing here uh, is that the bronzes, at least initially, are, are both struck and cast. So for the small denominations, they are striking them. For the large ones, they're casting them. Again, uh, they're showing their ability to you know, oversee and coordinate between different techniques that before had remained uh, sort of separate branches. <laughs> okay, so if I, I'll move to the historical conclusions before I do, here's, here's what I've got, right? Coins start in earnest around 300 BCE, uh, but not all of them may be coins and production remains initially slow for a very long time. We're talking about four different series of uh, Romano silver, uh, silver and, and units. Um, those are, some of them have fractions. Uh, the first two are very spaced apart. The next three uh, come over maybe a period of 20 years. There's not a lot of them, right? That is, there's a very long persistence. There's a, you know, several generations of persistence of old habits. The use of money bars, the use of ice rude, possibly the use of weights alongside new ones. Rome seems very mixed in terms of its monetary system. Uh, it, it doesn't transfer quickly. And it's a very long transfer, right? It's not, you know, oh, this is 20 years, but we're talking about, you know, grandparents and grandchildren um, having sort of different, different understandings of metal uh, next to each other for a period of basically three generations. The big shift to my mind comes after the First Punic War. It's, it can't be related to war itself. And it comes with that, again, uh, um, with the Roma sickle series with RRC 25 and with the club series RRC 27, which unify metals, which unify techniques and bring everything together uh, under this very long denominational spread. It, it's at that moment where hordes start to increase, where Roman coins start to take over hordes. We see that at Nora, uh, with the Nora horde in particular. Uh, we start seeing that with bronze uh, as well. Uh, and we're seeing just more dominant, sort of more imperial, you know, Roman coins look more imperial uh, in this period. And I think that's not uh, insignificant. That shift is perfected with the Quadrigatus. The Quadrigatus is a massive uh, production. Its, it's um, distribution is much wider than ever before. Uh, the hordes are much larger. They have over a thousand Quadrigati in some examples. Uh, they're very big. Uh, it is again a multi metallic, multi denomination, uh, multi technique, um, unified series here. It's, it's being produced in several mints in South Italy and Spain, uh, things like that. It's really setting the stage for the denarius and picking up on some of those threads that have been initiated by RRC 25 and 27. But it doesn't happen uh, until after the first Punic War and probably the first year, maybe the year before uh, the second Punic War, something like 219, uh, 218 for those few years beforehand. So Roman coinage is, is sort of going in coate for a very long time, for, for dozens of years. And that, I think, uh, is what we now need to explain. So I've got a few minutes left. Uh, what I'm gonna try to do in three slides is anchor all of this in Roman Republican history. I showed uh, Nick Terranato's 2019 book right there, uh, which I very rec much recommend. I don't agree with all of it, um, but he very much presses this idea that Roman society um, is multipolar, that the Roman state is fragile, it's weak uh, that the Roman state competes with families, um, competes with Italian families, that it, uh, it looks like a state when it's convenient to these families, that the families then take precedent when it's not, and that this sort of situation persists for a very long time. At some point, the situation changes. Rome is able to field you know, 80,000 soldiers, the Battle of Cannae. That's not something that families do uh, at that point, so something's changing. Uh, but I think we have to think about the sort of heterogeneity of the Roman state uh, in this period. And I think that this becomes fundamentally important uh, to how um, we understand uh, this coinage. Um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm just sort of assuming a basic understanding uh, of Roman history here, but I'm in a moment where after the Lex Licinia Sextia, uh, after the Leges Licinia Sextia in 367, uh, create a new consulship with patricians and plebeians. We have a new, not hereditary, but sort of office holding based elite. Um, these elites uh, compete with each other very uh, very vehemently for commands, 
Um, they, um, they fight against each other to promote themselves as more important within the state as others here. Um, and again, the sort of <laughs> heterogeneity of these families at the helm of the state is fundamentally important. What's really important about this for coinage uh, is that these elites had competing ideas of what wealth meant. So they're not all taking up this idea. Uh, they're not all embracing this idea of transactional coin-based wealth. Um, and that ideas of wealth, and particularly moralized ideas of wealth, are intrinsic to their competition uh, between each other. Um, and we find this in a number of different texts. I show you the Scipio Barbatus Elogium uh, up there. Um, but in particular, um, what, what I want uh, to stress for you is this funeral speech delivered for Quintus Caecilius Metellus by his son. Uh, Caecilius Metellus is consul during the First Punic War. Uh, the speech is delivered as death in the 220s uh, right here. Uh, and you can see all the things that his son praises him for. Uh, this is a man who wished to be a fighter among the first ranks. He wanted to be a great orator. He wanted to be the boldest commander. We have all the superlatives. He wanted to be the boldest commander. He wanted to manage the greatest affairs of state. He wanted to be held in great honor. He wanted to have the highest wisdom. He wanted to be the leading senator. And he wanted to find great wealth by appropriate means. We have this qualification here, pecunia magnum bono modo, right? That, that bonus there, you know, good is the most neutral and bland adjective in all of the English language, but in Latin, in the Republic, it means an enormous amount. You can think of the beginning of Cato's treatise on agriculture, in which he says, uh, a weir bonus, a good man uh, is a farmer, he's not a trader. So there is this moralized idea uh, that one should become wealthy, but only through the appropriate means. And, and what are the appropriate means? But you know, there is this sort of moral contest over what wealth means among uh, these various families of the Roman aristocracy in this moment. You can read this contest into all sorts of attestations from the period. Um, here is Livy's account of these two triumphs that happen back to back in the very earliest moments of the use of coins uh, at Rome. Uh, one is by Lucius Papirius Cursor, uh, this old uh, aristocratic patrician here. He comes to Rome, he celebrates uh, his triumph. The infantry and cavalry uh, have all sorts of symbolic displays of value here. They have civic crowns and mural crowns of Valerian crowns. Um, he has a bunch of spoils. And in fact, Livy enumerates his spoils in terms of, um, uh, he quantifies them. So he, he refers to 2 million 2.5 million bronze asses. One of the first triumphs where he gives us that quantification. It strikes us as monetary. But note that Papirius Cursor does want not, he doesn't really treat this wealth as tangible transactional money. Uh, what he does is he puts it all in the Roman treasury to sit there as a sign of his preeminence. He gives none of it to the soldiers. The soldiers hate this, right? But he gives none of it to them. At the same time, his colleague in office, uh, the plebeian Spurius Carvilius, a new man, uh, also. Uh, brings back to Rome an enormous amount of, um, of spoils, of, of monetized wealth, 380,000 asses, right? He puts, sorry, he puts 380,000 asses into the treasury, but the majority of this he spends. He spends on building a temple, maybe wage labor or slaves or something like that. And then he gives money, he gets cash handouts out to every one of his soldiers. Soldiers love this because Papirius Cursor is so stingy. But you see this very interesting contrast here, right, between the way these two people are conceiving of wealth and value. On the one hand, a Cursor sees wealth as intangible, as symbolic. You know, the soldiers get, you, you know, they have crowns. What, what else do they need, right? They have sort of aristocratic symbolic wealth, whereas um, Carvilius is very attentive to the material, the transactional world uh, of wealth here. And this runs through all of our sources uh, in the third century. By the later third century, by the moment in which Rome is, is rapidly transforming its coin system, RC 25, 27 are coming out. Eventually, uh, they'll put out um, uh, the quadrigatus. They are taking whole new approaches uh, to transactional liquid monetary wealth. Uh, where do we see this? We see this, for example, in the famous law, in the Claudian law on the size uh, of seafaring ships, which is passed right at the, at the uh, very earliest moments of the Second Punic War, at the same moment as they're making the quadrigatus, these must be the same elites who are deciding to make the quadrigatus right here, to trying to turn wealth into quadrigati right here. 
This is a law that provides, very famous law that provides that no senator, and this is Livy's account, no senator or senator's son should own a seagoing ship of more than 300 amphorae. Uh, this was reckoned to be sufficient to transport crops from one field and money-making um, profit was held unseemly to a senator. So this law is made, but like most Roman laws, this is an ex post facto law. It responds to a situation of the opposite behavior in Roman society. It reveals to us a fierce continuing moral debate about the meaning of wealth, but it also shows us that in fact, Roman senators are probably doing exactly this. They're trading a ton of wine. They're becoming rich uh, from market-based behavior, from trading in the wake of the First Punic War. And we know this spectacularly now from a number of pieces of evidence. This is a Greco-Italic amphora neck from the area of Ostia, published by Alcesi and, and, and Coletti in 2016. Uh, and on its neck there, it has a graffito. And the first half of the graffito is the name uh, of uh, a consul, Marcus Valerius. That's either uh, Valerius Masala, consul of 226, or Valerius Livinus, consul of 220, and then 210. Again, right, these are elites right at the moment of that rapid expand, that change from Romano to Roman coinage, the rapid expansion of coinage. Uh, and here they are, they're making a ton of money selling wine. So there's this big sort of phase shift in terms of Roman involvement in markets, in terms of Romans understanding of material rather than symbolic wealth uh, at the upper echelons of Roman society. Just because Romans are posturing about money making and unseemliness doesn't mean that even, this is John Darm said this years ago, of course, uh, that, you know, it doesn't mean that even at the elite level, they're not participating in this. So again, I think you know, we can better understand the inchoate and slow rise of coins at Rome, uh, the sort of step-by-step uh, step rise, if we understand it in terms of a competitive elite, not all of whom initially would have approved of the sort of things that coins do, the sort of making money uh, through trade. Only at a later phase, you know, as the First Punic War is opening up markets, um, is opening up Romans to, to Campanian trade, uh, to trade across the Western and eventually the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, do uh, elites start making money in this? And as they're making money in this, they're more interested in coins. They begin to monetize all sorts of activities. I'm not saying that Romans aren't making coins to pay for warfare, but I'm saying it requires a particular mindset uh, for that to take place. And I think that we can see that happening only in the second half of the third century at the same moment uh, that the Roma coinage, and here I show an example of RSC 25, uh, the sickle coinage uh, is starting to be produced. So that uh, is where I will stop uh, for today and open the floor uh, to questions. I hope I haven't gone on too long, um, but those are my new thoughts uh, on Rome's oldest coins. Thank you very much. Thank you, Seth. So we are a little bit, uh, uh, we got a little bit on the longer side, but uh, this was fantastic. So we have a lot of questions that are, um, I will just read them, uh, even if I don't know, I mean, I'll begin with the one I read, the one with the already written, and then I will um, open the floor for a little bit of discussion. If you're fine, we can perhaps uh, go a little bit over two o'clock, perhaps uh, two ten, if it's uh, fine with everybody. So. Um, Daniel Wolf, I don't know if he wants to, uh, if he wants me, prefers me to read the question or just ask the question directly. Anyway, uh, what evidence supports uh, the notion of Ptolemaic bronze of Tobol circulating in Italy or Sicily as models for the Roman had inverted eagle design? Yeah, I, so I have to say, I would, I, and I see Leave has put the article up, um, yeah, yeah, and I would yeah. refer you to that. I I will say there's a long-standing uh, thinking about relationships between Roman and Ptolemaic coinage in this period. Some of it's been walked back. So it used to be thought that some of the um, signs on uh, some of the diagrams were direct copies of, of Ptolemaic coinage. I think we've um, we've walked back that um, mm -hmm. opinion to an extent. But Rome is sending embassies to Egypt at this point. They're very familiar with the Ptolemies at this point. Um, and I don't know about the circulation of that October in particular. Um, I would think that Andrew, Andrew and Andrew would, would take up the topic, um, but links between Roman and Ptolemaic coinage um, seem very sort of plausible uh, in this period. Yeah, thank you. Okay, and uh, Richard Schaefer has a question for you. So I think if Richard can unmute himself, yes, and ask him directly, I think it's better. 
Uh, thanks, uh, Lucia. Uh, it's in the it's in the chat, but uh, basically, I wanted to uh, question the idea that the um, Unciai and the Simunciai of the early caste issues uh, have uh, little or no value, as as the speaker said. Now, Leave uh, commented uh, on my question that uh, uh, <clears throat> we're finding low copper content. So, I, what if what if they ask? Is there low copper content in the uh, smaller fractions compared to the uh, higher fractions and the and and the uh, asses? And uh, would that be true that intrinsic value small denominations were very much overvalued? I'm not leave answered it. Um, we are finding <laughs> stable. Um, uh, recipes across um, all denominations within a series, and most series look like they look like most other series. Um, I'm just going to give away the game, I think, and I, I think I said this in an earlier long, long table, I think there may be a change in formula at about the sickle series. Um, and Seth and I are putting our heads together over the next year to come up with what we think is going on there um, from a multi-directional standpoint. But the content of the bronzes is consistent within series and for the most part across series. It's very high lead um, and remark remarkably low copper. Well, if that's true, uh, Leave, then um, uh, you'd have to change what uh, um, what the speaker said in his talk, and that he said that the uh, small denominations had very little value. But if they were all uh, of a similar metallic content, uh, I can say from experience that uh, I don't believe that the um, the uh, smaller fractions are are. Uh, are of uh, much lower uh, weight than they should be. I think that the weights come out uh, fairly uh, fairly evenly. And the most striking thing about the small denominations of the cast bronze is that they're so common. You have to wonder, uh, I could see why Rome was producing asses to pay heavy fines, but why a state would, would issue uh, an equivalent number of trientes, of quadrantes, sextantes, and then go down to semi unchai is remarkable. And the only answer I can think for it is that they were used. They were used as money for small change. Right? That's just a thought. Uh, I have no so, evidence, but that seems natural. Yeah. So um, I, I should, I, I don't, I, their intrinsic value, um, I, I think intrinsic value is a problem with these coins because of the idea that, we, you know, we now know from Leaves metallurgical work that we can't use them. They, they could not be used as fully, as metal storage effectively, as, as you know, it, it takes a lot of work now with these coins to turn them into something. Their real value, however, uh, was um, minuscule. So one thing I did in the Rome paper is I collected the literary sources for these units um, in this period, and you know, an, an ass means something in a market. The, a semuncha, uh, it's it is very unclear to me what they would have been transacting if they're transacting what they would have been transacting a semuncha for. What what I think uh, those low units are important in things like uh, medicinal recipes, things like that, where where weight uh, is important rather than value. And so again, I come back to this idea that that these things may have been important within sets for weight rather than for, you know, you go to the foreign barium with your bag of uh, samunchai. Um, you know, I, I don't know what you would have been buying with your bag of samunchai. Whereas the, you know, the asses, which have very little real value uh, as well, um, you know, in terms of wages and, and uh, market items um, are, as you, you know, as you know well, are like this big. So, you know, and Crawford said this a long time ago, this is like Swedish plate money. It's like the most awkward thing in the world to imagine going uh, to any market with, you know, the amount of asses to buy something. You would have had to have some pretty serious biceps uh, to be doing this sort of transacting, so to speak. So okay. it's a weird coinage. Um, you know, again, it, it presents all sorts of strangenesses. And that's why a paper on the strangeness by leave uh, is a fantastic addition uh, to our knowledge. 
But any yeah. paper that addresses that has to address the fact that there are many, many of these small fractions. They were produced in very large amount. Whether somebody was carrying a bag of Semunchai to the market, I don't know, okay, but I think it's perfectly possible. There were many small things you could buy, a loaf of bread, half a loaf of bread, and you just have to account for the for the prevalence of these fractions, which is always is always impressive. Right. Me. But so, the the issue the issue with this is that um, you know, I mean, I agree, you know, structurally. The, the issue is that our evidence for a loaf of bread, half a loaf of bread, things like this suggests that these coins wouldn't have had any part. So, you know, while I'd like to agree with that, you know, the problem is that the evidence really doesn't, anything we have to support that um, does not. It, it suggests these have absolutely no value. So again, I think we have to ask different questions about uh, why they're using these than sort of traditional coin-based questions. Well, let me just ask one more question and then I'll, I'll be quiet. You just said that there's no evidence to support that these coins could buy a loaf of bread. I'm not aware of any such any such evidence. Why couldn't someone have come into the market with an uncha? No, sorry, that's yeah, and bought thank something you. So small. That's not what I'm arguing. Uh, what I'm saying is that the real value uh, of these coins is so minuscule that if you go to buy a loaf of bread, you're buying a loaf of bread in terms of a price in acids. Uh, but what not evidence? In Simuncha. What's the evidence you have for that? That's what I'm waiting to hear. What evidence I, do you I, have that it would not buy a loaf of bread? An uncha. I, I mean, an, an uncha. Yeah. Uh, I Why can, couldn't I mean, I have bought a loaf of I bread? I can pull up. Uh, why don't I say, if I get your email, I can send you what I've collected from the literary text. Okay. Is that okay? Sure, that's fine. Copy me in. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so I would like to, I have a comment and then I have a, and then I have a, an actual question. One of the things that strikes me as super strange is the way we do find certain denominations collecting together. So with at NEMI in the votive deposit, there's a propensity to donate certain denominations over other denominations. So watching how things are used is really useful. And then thanks to Richard himself, uh, um, Seth, there, there's what I call the pre-1986 hoard, um, which was a large find of south of Rome of uh, I signatum bars with a lot, with hundreds of um, trientes of the um, RRC 14 series. And the fact that it looks like hordes, like even within hordes, we might have collections of one denomination together and how the denominations um, uh, travel and finds, I find super interesting. That's my comment. Um, my question um, is on RRC, 16 and 17, the two earliest struck bronzes. Um, and how close or far apart in date would you like to put those? Say one more time. Oh, so you're talking about 25 and 27? No, 16 and 17. 16 and 17. Lion and the Minerva. Yeah, yeah, right. I don't, I, so they're super different coins because the- They are so, super different coins. Yeah. 17 has a, if I remember right, 17 has a huge amount of, um, of uh, dye variety, whereas, or is it, am I saying that the, the, one of them has a huge amount of dye variety and one uh, has a much sort of more standard uh, obverse to reverse uh, dye ratio. Yes, they you're both right. Need a, is, is you're that right. right? It's seven, 17 has a huge variety. Yeah. So they both need a new, um, they both very much need a new um, I'll send, so I just, uh, Richard, I've got this up on the screen, but I'll send it to you uh, in an email. Um, so I, I don't associate them much at all. It's very hard to understand what to do with those struck bronzes. They seem pretty isolated. Um, I don't think they belong to any of the silvers. Um, and I think that Christina Molinari is right to put down, um, to, to down date uh, 17 way after COSA. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think we even know. Even puts it after yeah. two forty. That's right. 
Oh, she puts it that late. She puts it that late. It's in her paper with Yaya and 20, um, in the ancient numismatics journal. Okay. I mean, yeah. Like, but it makes a radical difference in how we're reading information. Yeah. So this is one of the bigger changes in terms of interpreting any of these struck coins because, um, you know, you, when Crawford was working, when, uh, you know, in, in the 70s, um, the examples known were all, they all fit this idea of a Cozen prototype and, you know, maybe Cozen naval, but now it's a much more, that um, Marlene and, and Nyman's paper show, it's a much more diffuse circulation as well. So that coin is from, um, uh, you know, it's from Italy uh, and it's much later. It's a, it, I think it, it, we've not yet figured out a replacement model for it, but we have certainly undermined the old Cozen model for our C-17. I mean, uh, you know, obviously it still has um, par iconographic parallels, but something weird is going on. Yeah. yeah. So I, I would have other questions actually. Uh, we see Melissa that says that she agrees and she's going Yeah, to good. Us. That's the expert right there. So it's good exactly. to see Exactly. Yeah. And uh, exactly, she'll give a, a presentation, another long table for the ANS uh, soon enough. So I have myself other questions, but I think it's better for me to write them for you, to you because we are now well over time. This was amazing. And we really think that this would be a huge contribution. I mean, that we can use with students. So thank you students, scholars, great. And of course there is much more that needs to be discussed. So really thank you for now for this wonderful presentation. Thank you, Lucia. Thanks all of you. Okay, bye-bye.